the chair of uh, this panel. Um, we have three excellent uh, papers. Um, uh, courts always tell us that when we go to interpret legislation, we have to look at three things, uh, the text, the purpose, and the context. Uh, this panel uh, is going to look uh, primarily at the context. Uh, of course, there's always some debate about how far you take the context. Are you just looking at the neighboring words in the legislation, uh, or do you go beyond that? We, of course, are not a court. Uh, we can be, act more liberally. Uh, and we are going to look at the broader societal context, the historical context. Perhaps the most importantly is the context of the Chinese legal order, uh, the Chinese constitution, and of course, the Chinese law of national security. Uh, so we have three papers that look at different aspects of this broader context. Uh, let me introduce our speakers now uh, so we can move uh, more quickly as we go along. The first paper will be given by my colleague, Professor Albert Chen, the endowed professor in constitutional law who needs, who needs no introduction. I think as many people know, uh, whenever we have a, any kind of interesting constitutional development or crises, uh, we can always count on Albert to write uh, the kind of definitive uh, background piece uh, for uh, each uh, development. And uh, his paper is essentially that. Uh, it is uh, the, uh, very comprehensive uh, and uh, very interesting uh, uh, sort of go-to paper that one has to read when one looks at uh, this new development. The second paper is also uh, uh, another colleague of mine, Professor Han Zhu, uh, who is research assistant professor uh, in our faculty of law and also a graduate of our law school. And we'll be teaching our first national security law course uh, next year uh, as well. Uh, and she will be also looking at the uh, Chinese law context and arguing that the Grud norm has shifted, the Grud norm of uh, Hong Kong's legal order, the basic uh, law, uh, the origins of all law, I guess, has shifted from the British common law to the Chinese constitution, I guess, is what she will be arguing. Uh, so we look forward to that paper. And our third uh, paper, will be given by uh, two scholars from Wuhan University. Uh, Professor uh, Zhang Tang uh, is a prominent scholar in private international law uh, at the Wuhan University Institute of in uh, International Law. Uh, and also uh, Mr. Uh, Huang uh, is also uh, a student at that uh, institute. Uh, they have co-authored a very interesting paper on state secrets uh, and uh, the offenses in the national security law, but looking at it uh, from the perspective of the Chinese law on state secrets. Uh, and finally, and last but not least, we will be hearing from our Dean, uh, who will be the discussant uh, of all three papers. And so without any further delay, I'm going to call upon uh, Professor Chen uh, and invite you to speak for 20 minutes uh, on uh, your topic. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, the title of the paper, which uh, I wrote for the book, which uh, Hua Lin uh, and uh, Michael are editing, is the National Security Law of the Hong Kong SEL, a contextual and legal study. Uh, since uh, we only have very limited time for the presentation, I'll present the main part of the paper, which is entitled The NSL and Chinese Law. Uh, can we start the PowerPoint? So uh, the, in Chinese law, um, national security is dealt with uh, in a number of laws. Um, crimes against national security are mainly provided for in um, the Chinese Criminal Code, which was enacted uh, in 1997. Um, and in the Xi Jinping era, uh, there has in a, a uh, broadening of the concept of national security and the amendment of a number of new laws on uh, national security. Um, in theory, the central authorities could have chosen to apply some or all of these national security related laws directly to 
the Hong Kong as in out under Article 18 of the Basic Law, since uh, Hong Kong is not enacted its own Article 23 law. But the central authorities have not chosen to do so. Uh, instead, they have decided to introduce a national security law tailor made for Hong Kong that is of limited scope or coverage. The drafting of the NSL drew mainly on the relevant mainland law rather than Hong Kong law, as demonstrated in this paper. Um, we, will, we, 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 will, we will see how the NSL can be understood as a product of the mainland legal system, but it also contains some provisions specially tailored for the Hong Kong SAR and its circumstances, particularly those that emerged during the anti extradition movement of, nine, uh, of 2019. So I begin with the first uh, of the four types of national security offenses under the NSL, which is secession. Now in the Chinese criminal law, secession and incitement of secession are both dealt with in Article 103, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen in Chinese. And there's also an English translation, uh, which you can see here. Um, in the NSL, a secession is there within Article 20 and incitement of secession in Article 21. Uh, and you can see the English uh, translation here. Um, the core concepts and terms used in Articles 20 and 21 of the NSL can be traced back to Article 103 of the Chinese Criminal Code, which I'll uh, abbreviate as CCC, Chinese Criminal Code. Briefly speaking, generally speaking, the two NSL articles are expressed in more detailed language than Article 103 of the CCC. And also part of the content of Article 20 of NSL is not covered by Article 103 of CCC. Uh, Article 20 may therefore be said to have a broader coverage in terms of the acts prohibited and punishable by the law than Article 103 of the CCC. Article 20 refers to organizing, planning, implementing uh, activities that split the nation or damage national security. Now, most of these words can also be found in Article 103 of the CCC. However, Article 20 is more detailed than Article 103 in that it elaborates the meaning of succession by specifying three kinds of circumstances. Uh, as you can see uh, uh, on this screen uh, in both English and uh, Chinese. And you don't have such elaboration in the Chinese criminal code. It is also noteworthy that the penalty provision, which prescribes three penalty ranges depending on the circumstances, which you can find in the last paragraph of Article 20, is identical, uh, identical to that in Article 103 of CCC. The terms used to express the penalty are exactly those applicable in the PRC legal system rather than those used in Hong Kong. Uh, you can refer in particular to the Chinese version. Uh, those words are highlighted in red. Uh, uh, in Cantonese, such words as uh, uh, or gun zai, as well as jiao ke tui. These are terms used uh, in the Chinese criminal code. Uh, Interestingly, you can find another provision in the NSL Article 64 that provides for how these mainland style penalties are to be, as it were, converted into modes of punishment under Hong Kong's legal system. So you can have a look at Article 64 uh, yourself. Now we come to incitement of succession. Article 103, paragraph two of the CCC, which you can see on the right-hand side, uh, in Chinese and also here in English, provides for the offense of incitement of succession. While Article 21 of the NSL deals with incitement as well as assisting in abetting or providing assistance, uh, etc., by other persons of an, um, a, a, an Article 20 offense. Now, these, other these activities, other than incitement, such as abetting, providing assistance, and so on, uh, not expressly covered by Article 103, paragraph 2 of the CCC, but they are also punishable under other provisions of the CCC. So basically, these acts, uh, uh, these, uh, acts uh, covered by one of, uh, Article 21 of NSL, uh, NSL are also punishable under the CCC. 
There are some reported cases uh, in mainland courts of convictions under I-103. One of the most publicized cases is that of Eham Happy, a lecturer at the Central Min Chu University in Beijing, organizer of the Yuga online website. Uh, he was convicted of succession in 2014 and sentenced to life imprisonment. Most of the other reported cases were in the context of alleged separatists in Xinjiang and Tibet. In my view, the mainland case was unlikely to be of much reference value in Hong Kong, since the provisions in the NSL on succession are more detailed in defining the elements of the offense. And Hong Kong courts may also, as we discussed in previous sessions, take into account human rights standards in the ICCPR and, 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 and other documents in interpreting the nature and scope of the offense. Now we turn to uh, the second type of uh, NSL offense, which is, um, which is uh, subversion. The basic concepts and terms used in Article 22 and 23, which deal with subversion, are uh, derived from Article 105 of the CCC, which you can see uh, in Chinese uh, on the right-hand side, uh, and here is the English uh, translation. But Articles 22 and 23 contain more detailed language and have a broader coverage than Article 105, except with respect to one element, which makes the relevant NSL offense narrower than those under, the, uh, under Article 105. I'll talk about this in a minute. As in the case of penalties for succession, the relevant penalty provisions for subversion in the NSL and in the CCC are also the same. Um, now, Article 105, Paragraph 1 of CCC provides for the offense of organizing, planning, and implementing subversion of the state's regime or the overthrow of the social system. And the related offense of incitement to subversion is provided for in Article 105, Paragraph 2. These provisions may be compared with Articles 22 and 23 of the NSL. Like Article 105, Article 22 also refers to organizing, planning, implementing particular activities, but it is narrower than Article 105 in so far as it provides that the relevant activities, activities must involve the use of force, threat of force or other unlawful means. Um, the relevant activities must be intended to subvert the regime by one of four means. Uh, and uh, the four means are listed here, as you can see on the left hand side uh, in Chinese here and also in English. Now, among these four elements, which I'll call elements one, two, three, and four uh, on the left hand side on the screen, elements one and two are probably implicit in Article 105 of CCC. In so far as elements three and four are probably not covered by Article 105, the subversion offense under Article 22 as a broader coverage in Article 105. Elements uh, three uh, and four relate to obstructing the operation of the, the central authorities or, or the Hong Kong government or attacking or damaging the premises and facilities of an organ of the Hong Kong government. Unlike Article 105, the offense under Article 22 is limited to circumstances involving the use of force, threat of force, or other unlawful means. This requirement does not exist in Article 105. So I would like to stress this point uh, uh, in several, on, on several occasions uh, in this presentation. So Article 22 is narrower than Article 105 as far as, far, as, far as situations covered by elements one and two are concerned. Elements one and two are overthrowing the basic system or the regime uh, of the central authorities. Now, the narrow scope of Article 105 as regards elements one and two is highly significant and reveals a legislative intent that the criteria for the criminalization of subversion in the Hong Kong SAR under one country, two systems in the context of you know, sub subverting the mainland regime need not be as strict or entail as broad a coverage as those applicable in the mainland. Now, in mainland, the offense of subversion and the related offense of incitement of subversion 
which are both provided for in Article 105, have been used to prosecute critics of the regime, advocates of political reform and democratization, as well as some Wei Chuan lawyers. Uh, the details uh, are set out uh, in this slide. It is noteworthy that the limitation of relevant prescribed activities in Article 22 of the NSL to those involving force, threat of force or other unlawful means does not exist in Article 20 with regard to the succession offense. So if you compare succession under Article 20 with uh, subversion under Article 22, a, a, a main difference is that there's no requirement of force, threat of force or other unlawful means uh, in the case of succession. This shows that the legislative intent behind the NSL was to cast a wider criminalizing net with regard to secession than subversion. Elements three and four, which I just mentioned, were obviously included in Article 22. Uh, article, the elements three and four were included in Article 22 with a view to deterring certain actions that occurred in Hong Kong during the anti expedition movement such as protesters breaking into Lechko on 1st of July, 2019 and destroying many of its facilities, which if it happens now would be covered by, um, by uh, paragraph four. Or large crowds of people on different days during 2019 besieging the Lechko building, other buildings which house offices of the Hong Kong government, police stations, and even the building of the liaison office of the CPG in the Hong Kong SAR. So if they have these activities happen now, they will be covered by paragraph three. As regards Article 23, um, the wording is similar to that in Article 21, that is incitement. As far as incitement is concerned, the offense under Article 23 is more precisely defined and has a narrower of coverage than Article 105, Paragraph 2 of the CCC, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. So whereas Article 105, Paragraph 2 of CCC criminalizes incitement of subversion of the regime or the overthrow of the social system by spreading rumors, defamation, or other means, Article 23 applies only to incitement of the commission of an offense under Article 22, which requires an element of force, threat of force, or other unlawful means. Thus, if there's no incitement of the use of force, threat of force, or other unlawful means to achieve the subversive end, the offense under Article 23 cannot be established. This means that in the, whereas in the mainland, strong criticisms of its political system might amount to, to an offense under Article 105, Paragraph 2, the same criticisms might not constitute an offense under Article 23 of MSL, so long as the speech or writing concerned does not incite the commission of any offense as defined in Article 22. But much depends on how the words unlawful means in Article 22 is to be interpreted. If the acts incited are to be committed in Hong Kong, there is little doubt that Hong Kong law should be used in determining what is unlawful. If it is intended that the acts incited are to be committed in the mainland, even though the incitement takes place in Hong Kong, it is arguable that mainland law would, would be used for the purpose of determining whether an unlawful means is involved for the purpose of Article 23. Now I turn to uh, terrorism. Uh, terrorism is dealt with. Uh, in, uh, in Articles 24 to 28 of the NSL. And in China, in mainland China, there are offenses relating to terrorism provided for in the criminal law uh, or criminal code, CCC. And these provisions should be read together with the anti-terrorism law. So the relevant laws uh, are, are provided, for, uh, set out on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, the ATL, that is the anti-terrorism law, provides definitions of terrorism, terrorist activities, terrorist organizations, etc. It also establishes a state organ for leadership of anti-terrorism work, which has the power to, to, to designate um, particular groups or, or individuals as terrorist organizations and terrorist personnel. In the course of the trial of a criminal case, the court in mainland may also 
make such destinations. Now, what about terrorism in the NSL? Article 24, in effect, creates an offense of terrorism or committing a terrorist act. This does not have a direct counterpart in mainland law. In mainland law, terrorist acts such as killing, bombing, arson, etc., are criminalized by laws that directly criminalize such acts rather than by the anti-terrorism provisions of the CCC. However, the concepts of terrorism and terrorists used in Article 24 of NSL are based on the ATL, the anti-terrorism law. As regards Articles 25 to 27 of NSL, there do exist counterparts in the CCC, and the penalty provisions are also similar. It may be questioned why the central authorities in drafting the NSL decided to go beyond the existing approach in Chinese law and to create a new offense of committing a terrorist act. This was probably due to the need to deter acts of violence like those which took place during the anti extradition movement for the purpose of putting pressure on the government to accede to the protesters' demands. The creation of an offense of committing a terrorist act sends a clear signal to society that the kind of violence that occurred during the anti extradition movement designed to intimidate the government and members of the public would not be tolerated in the future and would be subject to particularly heavy punishment. This is probably the intended deterrent effect of Article 24. Uh, there's also Article 25, which uh, deals with um, terrorist organizations. Uh, and it is noteworthy that unlike uh, the case in the ATL, there's no mechanism under the NSL for the designation of a group of persons as a terrorist organization by any administrative authority. So it's up to the court to, to apply the NSL to determine whether a particular group is a terrorist organization. Finally, I turn to the fourth kind of offense, uh, which is collusion with foreign forces to endanger national security. In terms of drafting, Article 29, which deals with this matter, is probably the most complicated provision in the NSL. To facilitate discussion of this article, we can insert numbering uh, uh, for subsections or paragraphs, as shown uh, in this uh, final slide. Um, so, so we have uh, numbered uh, subsection one and subsection two of Article 29. Now, these subsections do not ex ex explicitly appear uh, in, in the existing text of Article 29. And I have also inserted uh, A, B, C, paragraphs A, B, and C in red and also paragraphs as one, two, three, four, and five in green. Okay, so understand the structure of, of the, the, the article, well, you have to note uh, all these uh, uh, subsections, one and two, and paragraphs A, B, C, uh, and paragraphs one, two, three, four, and five. Article 29 creates two independent offenses. The first is created by Article 29, subsection one, it is about leakage of official secrets to foreigners. The second is covered by Article 29, Subsection 2. This offense is committed where the existence of any of paragraphs A, B, or C is combined with any of paragraphs 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. We now turn to study Article 29 from the perspective of Chinese law. As in the case of the previous articles, we can discern a close connection between Article 29 and the existing law in China. However, some of the provisions in Article 29 were apparently designed to adjust Hong Kong circumstances and do not have counterparts in mainland law. In particular, uh, Article 29, Subsection 1, and Article 29, Subsection 2, Paragraph 1, which is in blue uh, color in this slide, correspond to existing provisions in Chinese law. Whereas Article 29, Subsection 2, Paragraphs 2, 3, 4, and 5 are specially tailored for Hong Kong. The concept of collusion, which is referred to in the title of Article 29 and is implicit in Article 29, Subsection 2, A, B, and C, is a concept in Chinese law, as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, because of time limitations, I will just focus on Subsection 2 of Article 29, which is in now, the word collusion, as I just said, does not appear in the text of Article 29 itself. But the concept of collusion in Chinese law uh, is reflected in the language of Article 29, subsection 2, paragraph B and C. The word 
Gouzhe, now we get in Cantonese or collusion in English, is used in the mainland law in Article 102 of the CCC, which creates the offense of collusion with a foreign state or foreign organization or individuals to endanger the sovereignty, territory, integrity, and security of the PRC. Chinese scholars refer to this provision as the offense of treason. So Article 102 is referred to as treason. The meaning of collusion is not elaborated in CCC itself, um, even though it is used, uh, even though the word is used in Article 102. But collusion was defined in Article 7 of the implementing rules for the anti-espionage law. So if you look at the implementing rules, uh, you, you discover the following. Article 29, subsection 2, paragraph C of the NSL, which contains the wording of acting under the direction or control of or receiving funding or other forms of support from foreign organization personnel uh, can be traced back to the defi definition of collusion in the implementing rules, which I just mentioned. And Article 29, subsection 2, paragraph B, which refers to conspiracy between a person and a foreign state organization or individual, um, also can be traced back to the implementing rules. The meaning of co conspiracy here is similar to elements of the definition of collusion in the implementing rules, such as planning together and jointly committing an act against national security. So it may be said that Article 20, 29, subsection 2, paragraphs B and C are both based on the concept of collusion in mainland Chinese law. When Article 29, subsection 2, paragraphs B or C is combined with paragraph 1, that is waging war, etc., the offense produced is akin to that of treason under Article 102 of the CCC, as I just discussed. Now, the more original provisions in Article 29 that do not have counterparts in mainland law were probably designed, and, and these were probably designed uh, to deal with Hong Kong circumstances. And the, and the provisions are Article 29, Subsection 2, Paragraph A, requesting. And Article 29, Subsection 2, Paragraph 2, serious obstruction uh, of the uh, Hong Kong or central government. Paragraph 3, manipulating or undermining an election. Paragraph 4, imposing sanctions on Hong Kong or China. And Paragraph 5, using unlawful means to provoke hatred. The term and concept of requesting uh, is arguably a natural extension of the concept of collusion, as I just discussed. The requesting name in Article 29, Subsection 2, Paragraph 1, refers to requesting a foreign state or institution to commit one of the specified acts against China's security. So among the acts specified in Article 29, Paragraph uh, 29, Subsection 2, Paragraphs 1 to 5, requesting would be more relevant to Paragraph 1, that is requesting foreign invasion of the PLC, and paragraph four, requesting a foreign state to impose sanctions on the PLC or Hong Kong SAR. So the less the intent be behind adding the requesting limb to the concept of collusion is probably the intent to penalize Hong Kongers who request or lobby foreign states to impose sanctions against the PLC or Hong Kong SAR. Such requests or lobbying did occur during the anti-extradition movement. The NSL, as we know, is not retroactive and cannot be used to prosecute those who committed such acts in the past, but it will have a deterrent effect in the future. So I've, I've um, exceeded my time, so maybe I will, I will not I will not go uh, on to talk about paragraphs two to uh, paragraphs two and five. But paragraphs two and five, in my view, were also framed with 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 regard to what happened during the during the anti extradition movement of two one nine. So, yes, maybe I will now conclude here. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Albert. Maybe we can take up some of those points during the Q&A. Thanks for that very meticulous examination of the text and the context and, and for pointing out uh, areas where the NSL actually goes beyond Chinese law. Let's turn to our second uh, paper now uh, by Dr. Zhu uh, on the shifting uh, Grudno. Uh, Dr. Zhu, may I invite you to speak for 20 minutes.
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to present my chapter with the most uh, prominent basic law scholars here today. Um, okay. Um, my chapter is uh, discusses the theoretical advancement underlying the NSL legislation and the Chinese law implications of the NSL for Hong Kong's legal system. Um, since its promulgation of the uh, since its promulgation, the NSL has been widely criticized for violating the basic law. Uh, to justify the legitimacy of the law, uh, two key constitutional and basic law theories have been promulgated by main authorities. Uh, they are the authorization theory and the, the narrative surrounding the validity of the constitution in Hong Kong. Uh, according to the authorization theory, the power to enact the national security laws under Article 23 is a power delegated by the central government rather than a power exclusively enjoyed by, uh, by the Hong Kong SAR. Despite its stipulation that the SAR should enact laws on uh, its own, uh, the term that Hong Kong shall enact the national security law indicates that it's a constitutional duty and the central government retains the power to interfere when such an obligation uh, is not fulfilled. In the Jimmy Lai case, the Hong Kong courts also adopted the similar line of reasoning to uphold the constitu constitutionality uh, of the NSL. However, the basic law does not specify how the central government should follow uh, certain procedures to grant or revoke powers to overcome the deficiency, a concept of co-governance on national security or the so-called dual check legislation series has been proposed uh, to overcome the deficiency. Uh, it claims that Beijing could enact the NSL for Hong Kong regardless of whether Hong Kong has fulfilled its constitutional duty. The co-governance theory further relieves central governments of the constraints imposed by the basic law. Uh, there are two basic law grounds uh, for the co-governance argument. First, according to Article 18, in a state of emergency, the central government can apply relevant national laws to Hong Kong, uh, which implies Beijing's power to maintain national security in the SAR. Uh, second, the uh, national security falls in under the defense umbrella, which is the central government's responsibility under Article 14 of the basic law. Uh, as a result, the scope of the terms defense and the national law in the basic law has been expanded. The authorization and the co-governance theories have created the legal uncertainties uh, concerning whether and to what extent the NPC and its standing committee will continue to enact national security laws or other laws for Hong Kong under Article 31 of the PRC constitu Constitution. Uh, as Article 31 provides that the system to be instituted in the SAR shall be prescribed by law enacted by the NPC. Some senior central officials uh, have said that the power uh, for the NPCSC to enact the national security law is not a one of power. Another key controversial issue regarding the legality of the NSL is whether the PRC constitu constitution constitutes the legal basis of the NSL. Uh, the underlying theoretical question is the validity and application of the PRC constitution in Hong Kong. Uh, in recent years, constitutional narratives in mainland have increasingly emphasized the constitution as a separate legal source. Uh, to uh, in Hong Kong. Such narratives are reflected in the NPC decision on NSL legislation, which is based on some specific constitutional provisions uh, without any reference to specific, specific basic law provisions. Uh, some scholars further asserted that the Chinese citizens constitutional obligation to maintain territorial integrity and state interests should also apply to Hong Kong. Uh, this line of reasoning was later formally adopted by the NPCSC decision on qualification of legal members. 
uh, relying on the constitution as a basis of the NSL legislation is a significant development in the basic law jurisprudence uh, and will have long-term consequences. It raises many concerns, such as the implicit amendment of the basic law, the relationship between the constitution and the basic law, uh, and also the compatibility between the basic law and the national security law, or any other national law promulgated for Hong Kong outside the basic law framework uh, in the future. Uh, all in all, the constitutional and the basic law theories promoted by uh, mainland authorities explain away the high degree of legal autonomy guaranteed by Article 18 of the basic law and Article 31 of the constitution. These two provisions which were expected to establish a firewall between the Chinese law uh, and the Hong Kong common law have instead been construed to legalize the imposition of the NSL and probably continuous legal intervention in the future. Uh, in this sense, the enactment of the national security law can be understood as a new constitutional moment. It kind of ushered in a transition from a basic law-based legal order to a new legal order based on the PRC constitution along with the basic law. Along with the theoretical advancement, uh, national norms and essential institutions have been channeled into Hong Kong through the NSL. Uh, the second part of my chapter explores the implications of such changes in um, five major areas of legal interface between Chinese law and the Hong Kong law. Uh, the first one is the application of mainland laws in Hong Kong. Uh, this is an old issue, but in addition to the previous two scenarios, the NSL creates a new way to bring national laws into Hong Kong. Uh, that is, national laws not listed in the Annex 3 uh, could also be applied to Hong Kong through those Annex 3 national laws in a non-emergency period. According to Article 18 of the Basic Law, national laws not listed in Annex 3 could only be applied to Hong Kong uh, during a state of emergency. Uh, however, Article 15.5 to 15.7 of the NSL de facto expands the scope of circumstances when such laws could be directly applied to Hong Kong, uh, be applied in cases. Uh, handled by the National Security Office in Hong Kong. Uh, it apparently contravenes Article 18 of the Basic Law. Asserting that Article 15.5 of the NSL can preempt a political unrest, the central authorities apparently aim to bypass the limits imposed by the Basic Law uh, that that ties their hands in handling urgent Hong Kong matters such as the anti-extradition bill crisis. The application of maintenance laws has caused two major questions. Uh, one is whether a national law should prevail if it contravenes the basic law and the Hong Kong laws. Uh, the second one is whether the Hong Kong judiciary has the power to review the NPCSC's legislative acts. Uh, so far, the Hong Kong courts have circumvented these questions. Uh, as before, by construing the NSL in tandem with the rights guaranteed by Hong Kong laws and uh, emphasizing the constitutionality of the NSL. Uh, in addition to the direct application of national laws in Hong Kong, many Chinese law theories and elements could also apply to Hong Kong implicitly. Uh, just as Professor Chen discussed, the NSL incorporates many Chinese criminal law provisions on offenses and the penalties. Uh, and the Hong Kong uh, law enforcement officials and the courts might also need to refer to Chinese law to clarify some key NSL concepts. Uh, and the Chinese constitutional and the administrative laws regarding state organs also, are also implicated in the national security law. Uh, they are related to the uh, power and the scope of responsibilities of the uh, national security offices and the many other uh, new organs in Hong Kong. Uh, the second aspect of the legal phase is uh, the interpretation of the law and the conflicts of laws. Uh, interpretation of the NSL 
face faces the same issues surrounding the interpretation of the uh, basic law. Uh, that is who has the power and the which approaches should be adopted. Although there's a general consensus that Hong Kong courts have the power to interpret the NSL while the NPCSC retains the final say, some issues remain unresolved. For example, the NSL does not provide any specific uh, procedures regarding the interpretation. So it's unclear to what extent and how the NPCSC would intervene. Uh, as to the interpretative approaches, uh, well, the CFI emphasized that the courts uh, will adhere, adhere to common law approaches. The CFA in the uh, Jimmy Lai cases uh, relied heavily on mainland law and official sources to uphold the constitutionality of the NSL. So it's unclear whether in the future uh, judges will refer to Chinese law and resources to interpret or understand the other disputed issues and the terms in national security case, cases. Um, the interpretation of the NSL has become even more complicated due, the, due to the multiple levels of non-conflicts as it incorporates both Chinese and Hong Kong law elements. Uh, there are three layers of uh, legal conflicts. Uh, first is the hierarchy and the conflict between the NSL and the basic law. Uh, the second is the conflict between Hong Kong local laws and uh, the NSL and its subordinate implementation rules. Uh, so the third one is the multiple internal conflict among NSL provisions themselves, particularly the potential conflict between Article 4 on guarantee, the, uh, the ICCPR rights and other provisions. Uh, and there has also been increased the presence of the maiden authorities in Hong Kong. Uh, the basic law has failed to establish an effective institutional mechanism uh, to facilitate intergovernmental interaction and the settlement of legal disputes between Beijing and Hong Kong. Uh, the NSL is one of the measures taken by Beijing to tackle the design flaw uh, and reshape the institutional landscape. Uh, in her chapter, Dr. Chen Jie has analyzed these new changes in a, a very comprehensive way. So here I'd simply uh, summarize that uh, the new institutional arrangement legalizes the interaction between the SAR government and the, and the liaison office. Uh, it deepens Beijing's reach into Hong Kong's bureaucratic system. Uh, it is also the first time that the central authorities legitimately uh, has the direct access to daily policymaking process within SAR government. Uh, and the governance model of Hong Kong uh, SAR has also further moved toward the executive-led government. Uh, the NSA also creates two exceptions to Hong Kong's legal criminal, uh, criminal legal system in claiming criminal jurisdictions the national jurisdiction and the, the actual territorial jurisdiction, uh, both of which have raised widespread concerns. The national jurisdiction provisions diminish the line between the two criminal legal systems uh, of mainland China and Hong Kong in dealing with national security cases. Uh, the most challenging issue is how to guarantee a suspect's ICCPR rights in uh, national security cases handled by uh, the central or the main uh, law enforcement. The other contentious exception is the actual territorial jurisdiction. Uh, well, great attention has been paid to its long arm effect over non-Chinese citizens overseas. Uh, its potential impact on the cross-border jurisdiction uh, has largely been ignored. My chapter identifies five scenarios that might occur and give rise to concurrent jurisdiction and mutual legal assistance issues. Uh, due to the time limit, I won't introduce each scenario here. Uh, it's just worth noting that the concurrent jurisdiction issue is a result of the duality nature of the NSL as it applies to both regions, and also the uncertainty whether Hong Kong enjoys in exclusive jurisdiction over ordinary national security cases. 
the final point of legal interface is the legal language. There are two well-known issues here. One is that there is no official English versions for the NSL and uh, uh, its subordinate rules. Uh, second is the inconsistencies between English and the Chinese versions. Uh, the NSL and the IR43 are probably the only legal documents that directly challenge the dominant position and the priority of English in Hong Kong's legal system uh, after the handover. Uh, and it raises concerns beyond the language itself. Uh, one of the issues is the restriction of a suspect's right to select lawyers. In the Tonkin Kid case, the court has adjusted this issue and held that a suspect's right to lawyers is not undermined, uh, but its line of reasoning still implies the indispensable position of a Chinese-speaking counsel in defending an NSL uh, suspect. Uh, so finally, I will wrap up my conclusion. Uh, well, the shift of Grunon in Hong Kong's legal order occurred in 1997, such a crucial transition did not attract too many concerns then. Uh, it mainly because the basic law had been able to play a controlling role, uh, and the Article 31 of the PRC Constitution stayed dominant, uh, stayed dominant uh, after imparting the after fulfilling its historical mission of imparting the legitimacy to the basic law. Uh, there was optimism then that Hong, Kong, that Hong Kong's legal system could largely be insulated from the influences of the Chinese law. Uh, however, the contradiction between the two political and the legal systems has been intensified uh, increasingly. In Beijing's view, the escalated disobedience and the serious governance crisis in Hong Kong signify wide defiance of the Green Dome, which greatly undermined the efficacy of Hong Kong's overall legal order uh, and the basic law framework. The NSL legislation is Beijing's attempt to reassert general adherence to the ground norm and establish the authority of the PRC constitution in the SAR. Uh, therefore, the PRC constitution finally works from behind the scenes to the front of stage, uh, borrowing Chinese Jamaican constitutional scholars' term uh, to frame it. Uh, along with the basic law, the constitution has become, to some extent, has become the supreme and the separate legal source of law in Hong Kong. Um, In this sense, the enactment of the NSL is kind of like a, a, a silent legal reform that has explicitly or implicitly uh, readjusted the key arrangements under the basic law uh, and also has reshaped a wide range of areas of Hong Kong's legal uh, regime. Through the NSL, new national norms and the central institutions have been brought to Hong Kong. Uh, governance structures has been reconstructed uh, Chinese law elements would further infiltrate into uh, judiciary interpretation. Uh, Chinese language has uh, implicitly established its precedent status. Uh, the boundary between the jurisdiction and the criminal justice systems in mainland and Hong Kong in dealing with highly political criminal cases uh, is blurred. Uh, so the best hope might be that the basic law could still serve as a filter to screen and control national norms and institutions into Hong Kong. And the NSL, the national security law, would stay as a latent threat after accomplish its mission of transforming a kind of state of exception to a stabilized ordinary politics. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhu, for your comprehensive and insightful presentation. Lots of food for thought there. Um, I, I know I have a couple of questions, but we'll save it for the q and I also noticed that you also touched upon the question of extraterritoriality. I believe in the last panel, there was a, a question about whether someone on the mainland could commit offenses under the NSL. And I believe yeah. Professor uh, Ling had said maybe not. Um, so you seem to suggest uh, that the person could be caught by the NSL, but we can discuss that further uh, during the Q&A. Let's turn to our third paper now, which is on the very important topic of uh, official uh, secrets or state secrets. Uh, and I'm very glad that we have a, 
a paper uh, on this topic uh, for the book, because I think it's a difficult topic. Uh, we have, of course, in Hong Kong, the piece of legislation which domesticated the UK law just uh, passed just before the handover uh, on official secrets, which really hasn't generated any, ca any case law. Uh, and then, of course, in the NSL, we noticed that um, it, it is mentioned in various places, but it wasn't treated as a separate offense. It doesn't even have a heading. Uh, it's just sort of planted in the collusion section, and then it's mentioned in a few other places on confidentiality and on procedural aspects. Uh, so, you know, I think it really needs closer uh, examination. Uh, and I'm glad that we have two scholars from uh, Wuhan University, Professor Tang and Mr. Huang, uh, who has looked at this issue very closely uh, and now will uh, speak for 20 minutes on the topic. Um, thank you. I want to thank, first of all, uh, Professor Fu for inviting us to present in this conference. Um, we are going to focus on part of Article 29 uh, of Hong Kong National Security Law. Um, Article 29 tackles unlawful providing state secret to foreign entities. Uh, what we are going to do is I'm going to provide a very brief introduction, then I will hand over to um, Mr. Xu Huang, who is going to discuss the first two points, and then I am going to uh, continue. Um, let me share the screen first. Right, so, all right, Article 29, a part of it deals with uh, state secrets. And, and we all know that states have the interest to prevent unauthorized disclosure of state secrets or intelligence, which is very important. Nearly all countries have enacted specific domestic laws or rules to protect state secrets. But on the other hand, these laws may have impact on the freedom of information. So there is a conflict of interests. One, on the one hand, we need to protect state security. On the other hand, we have to uh, protect the freedom of information. So what the law should do is to reach the delicate balance in the conflict of interest. And our job is to examine uh, the relevant provisions of article um, and articles of national security law and to check if this balance has been reached. Unfortunately, um, our research reveals that article 29 have three deficits, namely the ambiguous concepts, the low threshold and the lack of procedural protection. And it may bring about negative impacts in a number of areas and what we can do is only to focus on three major fields, uh, including press freedom, government transparency, and business security. Of course, there is also impact um, in academic uh, collaboration and research funding, something like that, but we are not going to uh, include it in this presentation. I notice there is other paper dealing with it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hand it over to my co-author, Mr. Huang, who is going to um, provide the intro general introduction of state secret legislation, and then uh, cover the ambiguous concept point, and I'm going to follow on. Okay, uh, Ms. Huang, it's yours. Uh, thanks, prof uh, thanks, Professor Tang. Uh, reviewing the state secrets relevant legislation in Hong Kong, Official secrets audience is the main legal test and has relatively narrow application, causing it inadequate to protect state secrets components with the requirements of Article 23 of the Basic Law. The national security legislative provisions bear 2003 try to fix it but was abandoned due to strong protest. According to Article 62 of the National Security Law, Article 29 has priority in conflict with the OSO and replaces it in cases within its remit. Uh, 
The question is the standard of interpretation. Article 29 is vaguely drafted, causing many concepts unclear. Article 65 provides that the power to interpret the national security law is vested in the standing community of the National People's Congress. Considering relevant uh, mainland laws and the uh, national security law are both enacted to protect national security and the uh, essential national interests of China, it is likely that the SCNPC will interpret Article 29 inconsistent with the concepts in mainland laws, characterized mainly by civil law. Some commentators argue that the Hong Kong courts have no interpretation power because the national security law does not include a provision authorizing Hong Kong courts the power of interpretation or clarifying the referral procedure. However, the national security law does not exclude interpretation by the Hong Kong courts. While Hong Kong, the Hong Kong courts adjudicate in Hong Kong, excluding any interpretation power is not practical. We suggest Hong Kong courts have interpretation power in adjudication, which is subject to the prevailing power of the SCNPC. And the first issue is the ambiguous a uh, uh, concept of state secrets is likely to run a risk of overclassification. There are three classification approaches, class-based uh, referring to the types of the information, produce-based referring to the damages of releasing, and the source-based referring to the classification authority. OSO adopts the combination of the class-based and produce-based approach, but mainland Chinese law adopts the combination of the source-based and the produce-based approach. The main difference is mainland China heavily relies on the decision of classification authority to classify state secrets. Because no definition of state secrets or intelligence concerning national security in national security law, it may refer to the definition in the mainland legal system. The definition of state secrets is mainly defined by the state secrets law, but it is drafted ambiguously and technologically, causing the scope is too broad and the living classification authority brought its discretion and liberty to classify any items as state secrets. The SSL defines state secrets as matters which relate to the national security and interests. Article 9 of the SSL lists seven categories of matters covering politics, economy, national defense, foreign affairs, many military affairs, science and technology, social development, and the criminal offenses. However, this illumination cannot provide much help either. For example, classified matters involved in the national economic and social development or science and technology are extensive in scope and include a wide range of uh, potential confidential issues. It leaves the classification authority broad discretion to classify any such items as state secrets, from trade secrets to quest exam questions. More importantly, Article 97 is a catch-all provision that stipulates other classified matters as determined by the State Secrecy Administrative Department. This provision potentially leads to the unlimited application of state secrets in any circumstances an authority may feel fit, which may need to abuse of power. And in mainland China, the, the ultimate authority for determining state secrets is the National Security uh, National Administration for the Protection 
of state cigarettes, which could uh, formulate nationwide binding norms on the scope of cigarettes and the basis for classification. It exercises a centralized micro control of the classification. However, in the absence of the uh, practically measurable classification standards or guidance, the classification system in China is still decentralized and compartmentalized in practice. The, uh, so the decentralized system leads to the risk of overclassification. And it is unclear under the national, under the national security law whether the classification of, uh, of, uh, of state cigarettes in Hong Kong is, will be lifted to the court or Hong Kong may designate relevant official authorities as classification authorities for the classification purpose. But it is likely that the Hong Kong court will maintain its judicial competence to classify state secrets in relation to Hong Kong. Uh, next four parts will be presented by Professor Tang. Thank you. Um, so I will continue with the second deficit, that is the low threshold. Um, Article 29 um, demonstrated a relatively low threshold to convict for the state secret offense. There are three points I want to focus. The first one is about the offender. Article 29 does not specify any specific identity of persons who is publishable under this crime. Instead, there is a very broad provision that applies this law equally to any members uh, of the society, so including members of security and the intelligence offices, public services and the government contractors and the ordinary people. We know that the state secrets offense have very close connection with people's identity. Different people have different levels to access to information, different duties to protect information and different knowledges to the nature of uh, information and different understanding of the consequences of releasing certain information. But the law simply apply the same standard and criteria for different people. That would make ordinary people extremely vulnerable under this crime. And also uh, foreign entities that acquire the state secrets are punishable as the co-offender. Foreign institutes are very broadly defined too. It includes a wide range of institutes, political or non-political, military or non-military, all subject to the same threshold. We also understand that different institutes acquire different types of information to achieve their purpose and for daily operation. So cross-border academic collaboration, for example, in the research on contemporary Chinese affairs, inter internal politics, uh, fundamental policy or sensitive social issues, they may easily come across certain information that are classified. Foreign research funders that fund this type of uh, this type of research may also worry they will be treated as buying state secrets, and the foreign press, um, we will say later, will be very vulnerable in reporting political information. So this low threshold and uh, the, the unidentified offender would provide certain pressure for uh, 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 some uh, organizations and entities. The second issue is about damages. Article 29 does not say anything about damages. So look at wording. It suggests that uh, the activity to steal, spy, unlawful, acquire, or release classified information per se would uh, be enough for the conviction. Um, and the consequence and the seriousness of damages may only be relevant to the penalties. And that is another point that may make uh, the offense uh, relevantly easy to um, convict, especially for ordinary people. And finally, um, the issue is mens rea is not very clear. Article 29 does not specify uh, what type of mens, mens rea is required for the state secrets offense. 
but it does not mean Article 29 would suggest strict liability for state secrets offense. Some clarification may be drawn from the Chinese law and the cases. Um, look at the interpretation of Article 111 of PRC criminal law. Um, it suggests that the perpetrator for state secret offense need to know or ought to have known the information is classified or relates to national security and interest. However, it does not require the actual or exact correct knowledge of the classified information um, to be uh, to, to exist. Um, the simple perception of the importance and the relevance of information to the national interest will be enough. So in other words, one may be convicted without actual or exact knowledge that the information is classified as far as he have certain understanding or he ought to know this information uh, may have connection with national interest, it is enough for the conviction. So in general, the threshold is low. And the final deficit I want to point out is an insufficient due process protection. Um, according to a national security law article 41, when a trial may involve state secrets, defendant may be deprived of a public hearing. And under article 46, upon the certificate issued by the Secretary of, of Secretary for Justice, the defendant may also be deprived of a jury trial. So that will bring us to what we call the secret trial. The purpose of the secret trial aims to protect state secrets from being further leaking. So that is understandable. Very similar provision can be found in the European uh, Conventions of Human Rights. It provided that public hearing is a fundamental human rights, but also suggested that, suggested that um, if it is necessary to protect national security or state uh, secrets, um, the defendant may not have public hearing. However, uh, it, it, it is necessary to mention that procedural justice is particularly important in the absence of public hearing um, because that will be uh, there to protect public confidence and trust of the overall system. So procedural justice um, in the lack of public hearing generally can be protected through the independent and the impartial tribunal, a rigorous adversarial process and the publicly available judgments. Arguably, these elements of the Hong Kong judicial system will remain for the state secret trial. Um, Article 41 of NSL national security law specifies that even if public hearing may be denied for state secret reasons, the judgment shall be publicly announced. However, it's important to note that it's not enough to build public confidence and trust simply by announcing the conviction and the penalties. The judgment should, enough, should include sufficient details of the grounds on which the judgment is based um, and that um, will, will provide sufficient justification. Um, so another issue I want to mention is uh, because of the relatively low threshold of conviction and the lack of explicit requirements of damaging result, the nature of the disclosed information is crucial to the state secret offense. So whether or not a state secret conviction can be successful really very primarily depends on whether the information is classified as state secret. But it has been discussed before that Hong Kong court will not be able to review classification by the relevant authorities in China. So if the um, trial is about disclosing state secrets in China, Hong Kong court will not be able to review the classification. That will be classified by the authorities in China. And the level of judicial review of the classification of state secrets in Hong Kong is also uncertain. So the lack of sufficient judicial scrutiny on these very crucial elements may weaken the system. So that brings about the procedural due process challenge.
So because of these three deficits, um, there may be negative impacts on certain areas. Uh, I will simply focus on three. Due to the time uh, limits, I may not finish everything, okay? So the first area I want to talk about is the press freedom. Um, Article 4 of national security law clearly provides the guarantee to press freedom. However, it doesn't provide the details. So it is likely that Article 4 is a very general abstract principle provision. Observe, uh, observers uh, and commentators suggest that Hong Kong judges are really conservative. That means Hong Kong judges, when they hear in a, 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 a case and make adjudication, they will strictly apply in the specific black letter law. And usually they are not going to look beyond the law and consider their constitutional duty to protect the freedom of press unless there is specific provision, procedural and a specific law. So it is likely without any specific law, Article 4 may not really put in force by judges in practice and may only serve uh, actors' lead services. So uh, the, the, the potential impact of Article 29 on state secrets on Hong Kong may be implied from what happened in China because you know, China has a long tradition to protect state secrets over uh, press freedom. And it, 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 it published uh, a series of administrative regulations to um, control and regulate press and media. Um, this type of control um, have well, ha haven't existed in Hong Kong yet, but it is not sure whether it will be introduced in the future in order to keep media and the press online with um, the national security law. So control existed in the four fields. The first one is to regulate in press and the media. Um, and the, basically the press and media have to do the self-censorship um, to censor the information and classify whether it belongs to state secrets. If they are uncertain, they have to report it to the official supervisor for, um, uh, for approval. And, and the second level is regulating journalists and the practitioners. And, uh, and, and the, the, the task is given to the media that has employed those journalists and the practitioners. And the media have to um, adopt internal procedural to, um, and to, to, to do the uh, self-censorship and, and use contract um, to regulate the behavior of journalists and the practitioners. And the journalist uh, is not allowed to report uh, or, or write articles for foreign um, media and the press. And the third level is to regulate um, internet um, express. So basically there is no regulation um, targeting self-media led by the general public uh, yet. However, the control is exercised through the control of internet platform. So the internet platform have the duty to identify the owners of the account, to strengthen the control, to strictly implement the real name registration system and to do censorship, to close the account, to delete the post, or so. Um, so, so the, the control of general public uh, on, on the um, uh, self media basically is given to the regular uh, to, to the uh, platform. And the final level is to control foreign media. And basically, um, the foreign media cannot um, engage on the online publication, and the foreign media cannot receive articles written by the uh, journalist uh, employed by the mainland media and the press. So there are all sorts of controls. Article 54 of Hong Kong National Security Law expressly requires the Chinese and the Hong Kong authorities to collaborate and to take necessary measures to strengthen the news agencies of foreign countries. So it is very likely um, as time goes by, a similar level of control may exist. Um, the second point I want to talk about is open government information. Um, 
basically citizens have the right to know, and that is very important to tackle uh, uh, government corruption. Uh, but uh, citizens' right to know sometimes well conflict with protection of state secrets. So if a government information is classified as state secrets, it is not going to be disclosed. In the mainland China, there is open government information regulation that facilitates government to open the information to the general public. However, this is just a regulation, so it is ranked lower than the law and subject to the control of state secrets law. And the government have to take census procedure as well to check if the information really belongs to the state secrets. And uh, there is also a social stability exemption. So if uh, information is not a state secret, but disclosure may cause social instability, that will again um, deny uh, disclosure of information. Look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong has no statute or legislation facilitating open government information. What Hong Kong have is a non-regulatory uh, code um, to code on access to information. So that is, again, not, the, uh, not at the level of law. So it will be subject to control of the national security law. So after national security law entered into force, we already entered into force, it is likely that the very similar censorship will exist and the government had to censor the information to, collect, to, to decide whether it is classified before uh, it can uh, open information to the general public. And the last point is about business security. Um, state secrets, unfortunately, may overlap with what we call trade secrets. And it is very difficult to separate state secrets from trade secrets. And there are three approaches in general. The first is harm-based approach, and that observed consequence and interest harmed by unauthorized disclosure. But this harm-based approach cannot work very well because sometimes the um, disclosure may cause harm to a, a specific enterprise. But if that enterprise is state-owned enterprise, it may be arguable that the interest harmed is a national interest. So that will generate the state secrets um, problem. And the second approach is identity-based approach. Uh, it says the market operating enterprise may hold trade secrets, but the military uh, related uh, enterprise may hold state secrets. But this classification again is not realistic because uh, even tr uh, military uh, company may also hold a secret that only, ha only have a trade interest. And then finally is the nature based approach. So it will look at the nature of information. Important information may be state secrets, non-important information may not. But this classification by itself will cause a problem because some information that has been considered rather unimportant, such as the map of Chinese border, the weather forecast, the publicly available past newspaper have been in the past classified as state secrets by the Chinese, by the mainland court. So it is very difficult to separate state secrets and the trade secrets. And that will generate risks for foreign entities who try to deal with a state owned entities in China, because those state owned entities may hold a lot of information that may be classified as state interest, as state secrets. And uh, a typical example in the past is the real Tinto case. And this case shows that uh, the classification of state secrets sometimes may be influenced by political instead of legal consideration because the defender uh, who was obtained for alleged leaking state secrets in the beginning but later was charged for leaking trade secrets so this downgrading may be caused by policy consideration because china has been trying to disentangle the relationship between state-owned enterprise and the government after accession to WTO and try to preserve Chinese state-owned enterprises image uh, in the international market. So, um, so this 
a, a downgrading may not suggest China has taken softer hands on state interest in general. And this ambiguity may cause a difficulty uh, for a lot of enterprises uh, trying to engage in Hong Kong and uh, mainland uh, state-owned company. Um, okay, so this is the general uh, observation from our research. Uh, and uh, our final conclusion is um, a state secret offense in Article 29 is ambiguous and unclear. It is very important for a national um, um, People's Congress Standing Committee to provide clear interpretation to clarify those points. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tang and Mr. Huang for your very informative presentation. You make a good point about mens rea. It's not clear in Article 29, but I think if a Hong Kong court was looking at this offense, they would see that it, it concerns stealing and the law of theft is quite clear that it does require full knowledge. And also uh, there is case law that presumes the mens rea, it's not clear. Um, at this point, I'd like to now ask our Dean uh, to give his commentary on all three papers. Thank you. Uh, I, I shall be uh, brief, so uh, we could have more time for uh, discussion. So, so on the, the, uh, uh, the first two papers um, um, here, certain research interest questions, and the third paper is, um, uh, um, uh, is a standalone article on the uh, Chinese uh, secret law. I think the point that is well made by the authors is uh, is a, a sort of a law reform proposal given the uh, lack of a clear definition on state secrets, which is the case almost every jurisdiction. So uh, the author, I think, rightly called for sort of a, a standing committee interpretation to clarify legislation. So to push the uh, uh, sort of a burden back to the uh, lawmaker. Uh, let me just. Uh, go back uh, on the first two papers. I think when Simon mentioned that at the very beginning in introducing the session, you mentioned the text and the context. So we're uh, thinking about well, in, in, in the application of mainland law or the, the mainland constitutional influence in Hong Kong, so much has changed in the past two years, but nothing has changed in the text. So I guess uh, as the, the shift is in really in the context, uh, and then it gives uh, mean, uh, new meanings to almost everything, right? So since in Thailand, we talk about constitution, or basically it's a living tree, it evolves, and it has evolved uh, from in Thailand to, to the uh, high-speed real case and the series of uh, the uh, NSL cases, you could see, can nearly see the the direct impact of the Chinese constitution and national law. Uh, um, so, so naturally it evolved and the uh, courts accept this uh, particular version, right? Uh, if you go back to say 10 years ago, when you talk about the Chinese constitution, the, the prevailing view was that uh, Chinese constitution applies in Hong, applied in Hong Kong via the basic law. Right? Uh, so, Basic law is the gatekeeper, uh, which will decide which provision of the, the constitution applies in Hong Kong, which uh, or not. But uh, that is clearly the past interpretation. Now, uh, uh, our methodology on standing has uh, clearly uh, uh, evolved. Now, now the, the, I think the one direct question uh, is. Now we all agree, since the high-speed real case, uh, the standing committee or the MPC are uh, the authority who can make law for Hong Kong, right? Uh, with or without the basic law, right? You can make a decision uh, independent of the basic law. I think the recent decision by the Court of Appeal in the, uh, the uh, high speed real case at uh, paragraph 66 said that very clearly, right? I, let me just read this uh, 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 paragraph and save and accept that the socialist system and the policies shall not be practicing in Hong Kong. The constitution as a whole must apply 
to the Hong Kong SAR as an inalienable part of the People's Republic of China. Right. That's well understood. So the, the, the remaining question, which seems to me it is, a, is an interesting one, is I see um, uh, some uh, different interpretations between a, in Heinz paper and in Albert's paper. Right? In Albert's paper, I think uh, the my interpretation is the approach is right, the standing committee has the full power to make law for Hong Kong. Uh, uh, I think Albert used the term the uh, concurrent power to to make national security legislation. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I think Han was trying to make an argument when national security law is justifiable for the reason that. Uh, uh, there was the Article 23, Hong Kong was not able to make the uh, legislation and there was the crisis. Therefore, on that particular ground, right, the intervention is justifiable. So, so, so the same to me, the, uh, the argument that, that there is a requirement of a very specific, uh, particular justification to invoke uh, a national legislation. But if I read the high speed real case, uh, read, uh, part of Albert's argument is, so the, the power is constitutional, right? This uh, NPC uh, um, um, and standing committee has the power to make law, and therefore, uh, as long as it uh, complies with the basic requirement, then uh, 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 it is constitutional. So that, that probably is, uh, uh, um, a, a, maybe a debate or slight uh, different uh, interpretation. Um, so now, so national security law is with us. So, so that is probably the first major legislation uh, um, uh, uh, directly made by the uh, NPC and the standing committee uh, um, for Hong Kong. I mean, we are told from time to time there may be other legislation coming by. Um, and because the, the legislature has the full legislative power. So what, what uh, Hong Kong could do to um, uh, uh, manage that? Right? There, there could be two theories, right? Um, one, theory is I was reading the the first uh, 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 case of the bill application I think at the, the, at the trial the, the justice was trying to make an argument that we could localize national security law right uh, so uh, I'll use uh, Simon just mentioned uh, domesticate uh, the national law so somehow it's, we could use the common law way of interpretation, somehow to, to internalize, to absorb the impact of this national legislation. Uh, I think the judgment uh, was very interesting uh, uh, using a different methodology. You start with a national security law, but actually you end with the criminal procedure law. So what the, the beef, uh, the, the really substance of the, the judgment is how to uh, give, to inform the interpretation of Hong Kong criminal procedure law in the context of national security law. So basically the NSL is still in the background, right? it's in the context, what is the driving, the driver of, of the, the judgment is still the Hong Kong's criminal procedure ordinance. Of course, that decision was criticized. Uh, uh, then we have we have a different uh, approach. Right? So there, so we still have this alternative. Right? Uh, I would like to say, I mean, the debate continues. I think there there, there will be uh, uh, different interpretations on different cases. Um, as uh, Albert just mentioned in his presentation, most of the mainland case law will not be applicable in uh, um, in Hong Kong. Uh, necessarily, the Hong Kong court would have a fresh interpretation uh, to the uh, national law. Uh, the bound to be inconsistency, 
the debunk to the different understanding of law. Uh, it will be interesting to look at the, the um, ongoing trial, uh, the two uh, criminal charges, right? Of what is terrorism, what is uh, uh, secession, uh, the bound to be different understanding uh, between the two uh, legal systems. As long as uh, one country, two systems continue to apply, we are given the uh, assurance that it, it will continue to apply, then uh, the, the judges, the courts would have to look at the, the, the different definition and try to uh, give meaning to the the words in, in the law according to the common law understanding. So that probably would happen, right? So those are the two uh, approaches. One is more deferential approach. Another one is to attempt to, 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 to localize uh, or domesticate uh, national law and apply them in a uh, unique common law uh, context. Um, my colleague, Kara uh, uh, Chen, has uh, written a fascinating paper uh, uh, and uh, tried to study the application of uh, the national security law using uh, another that German uh, scholar, uh, dual state. Right? Um, the, the argument is that uh, the national security law, uh, I think I have to add that probably together with the jurisprudence before that, include, including the disqualification of lawmakers and others, uh, then we have created a, a separate spheres in the Hong Kong's uh, legal system, right? Uh, in a way that we are looking at this uh, uh, um, Hong Kong's legal system from a, a different perspective, right? In a way, the national security law may have carved out a, a small portion of the, the system and is subject to uh, um, uh, the mainland jurisprudence. Um, uh, Paul Jim mentioned in his uh, uh, commentaries in the earlier session that you know, in those cases, judges may have to look at the law, but then sometimes beyond law. So those uh, are very sort of exceptional uh, a sphere now has surfaced in Hong Kong. It is a new phenomenon. I'm not quite sure whether uh, judges, scholars are comfortable with that particular concept. And we are trying to get used to that particular way of thinking about judging, about uh, uh, legal theories. Um, um, so at that particular moment, I, um, most of us have said uh, it's too early to make the judgment. There, there are not enough cases uh, to develop the jurisprudence. We may have to wait for a while. Um, my, uh, our former dean, Michael, has said repeatedly, we may have to be patient to watch out and to say how those case laws would uh, evolve. Um, those are three fascinating papers, which gave really a very informative right, uh, to introduce a new dimension into Hong Kong law. Right? Uh, we all have to get used to, to that. Uh, that is the relevance of the mainland legal norms, right? the mainland legal institutions, and the mainland way of legal interpretations. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean.